Right. So starting off with, I think it's a good idea to start really setting your parameters. So we've got <coughs> three <coughs> rather large areas. There's the, the two cottages and this area, perhaps this field here, this corner of the, the ground is the biggest section. But when we're looking at structures, these two are definitely the larger. So I'm going to start off with marking those out. And I'm going to start with the top parameter of perhaps this cottage here. So I just put a, a line. So it's not going to go any higher than that. Um, and then the other one, which is a bit lower down, I'll take a level across, I'm trying to keep my resource level level across this way and so now i've set the respective levels that's the taller one this is the shorter one that's okay um i'm going to also now set what i can see of the bottoms of the building it's quite difficult on this dark photocopy to see it but I can assume that this level on the pavement here, on the pathway, is the bottom of what I can see visibly of the cottage. Will there be a foundation below that? Sure. So now I'm going to set that line. Ah, here's Bill and Mary Lynn now. I'll just let them in. So I've set the bottom now of the... Um, the cottage um the the bungalow is very difficult to see because it's um in the shadows but what you can see i would mark the bottom of that so that would mean i'm going to mark there and it's quite close to being in line with the other one to be fair they're not too far away from each other they're both sort of on the ground plane um so expect them to be similar so there there's the um, top and the bottoms of both of the buildings and now i need to find their um their heights um so i'm now looking at their vertical lines so let's start with this one here may as well that's the line on that cottage and i can just gauge that from the edge of my photocopy sheet and that will tell me it's around about there. So I'll place that in. And then to get the width of the building, I'm going to go to there. So I just gauge that from the same place, which is the end of the photocopied sheet. To there. So what you're likely to end up with is a box for the first building. Now everything within this box, everything of the building should be contained in that box. Okay, so once you've got that, then we can move on to the next building. Um, and once I've got this measured in, I'll just pause briefly. Okay, so I've got my left hand side of this building boxed in. And now I'm going to go for this measurement here, which is the right hand side of the building. So again, what I'm doing is just establishing as ever, the basic geometric shapes. And the, and the bungalow is a little bit longer than it is tall, as you'd expect. So bungalows in there and the cottage is there. So I'm just going to briefly pause while you're doing that. Okay, so we've got the two boxes. Into those boxes will go our two um, canal side buildings. And now I'm going on to the next biggest thing. And the next biggest thing I think is the canal itself. So. If we put our knitting needle in line with the canal towpath, um, 
you will find that it is a diagonal. It's a diagonal and it pretty much goes all the way up to about two fifths of the way up the sheet. So where is that? Well, it's actually very easy to establish. It's the ground level, which is where the buildings are in line. So if you want to just carry on with that line there, that's good, because that tells you where to point your knitting needle to, to that line. Um, but to establish where that point there is, that takes a little bit more consideration. What we have to do is gauge from the left or the right, whichever you prefer with your knitting needle like so, and then just transfer that mark to there. So then you put a little cross, and this is almost like our vanishing point on the horizon. So we treat it like that. So now I can put my knitting needle in line with the, the line of the canal. Now I do um, bear in mind that that almost is like a little dog's leg, it bends there. But just ignore the bend on the landscape. Just think about the line running along the pathway here because it just so happens that also corresponds with the line of the water okay so what's that well that to my mind if it were a moment on the clock it's about 16 minutes to the hour it might be closer to 17 whatever you think it is as long as you can transfer it to there and it wouldn't matter if you're a little bit out, to be honest, because when you uh, when you set the um, perspective for the canal line, like so, everything else is going to get set from that. So if you're a little bit out, it shouldn't matter too much, but try your best to get it as close as you can on that sort of line from there to there. I'll just switch my other line uh, light on while you're doing that. It's just getting a bit dim in here. The light's going. That's a bit better, I can see now. Um, so where do we go from here? Well, of course, the canal has two sides. <laughs> so we have another line. Now, it, you would think that it would be therefore parallel, which it is in reality. But because this is going away from us to the right, it does slightly converge to the right. That's the rules of linear perspective. So yes, I could just bring my knitting needle down a little bit, but when I do that, I allow for a little bit of convergence. So did you see what I did? I just slightly diverge the line on the left. Just a little bit, not a lot, fractional, but it, it is there. So I try my best to imitate what I'm seeing. So there's, there's my next line. Now, I did mention that the banks do um, change their direction. It gets wider here. That's to allow several um, canal boats to queue to go through the lock because it just so happens that on this boundary here i believe it's warwickshire going into staffordshire beyond um in the olden days <laughs> probably not that long ago really but the boats used to uh queue here to get through that lock because it's lower the other side the um warwickshire is slightly higher than staffordshire beyond uh, and you and you know that this was quite a um, probably know that this was quite a well used canal system because Staffordshire's where the potteries are, so there were a lot of sets of china coming along this waterway, no doubt, and probably clays going the other way. So it gets wider here. So what am I? I'm going to do here is I'm just going to check to see what that angle is there and how do I find its location? So to find its location, actually, I just take a gauge. You can probably see from the bottom there. I'm going to use my knitting needle gauge from the left and just transfer it to there. So I know that that's where the change in direction begins, just down there. 
And if I point with my knitting needle, it just so happens there's a bit of a correspondence between this line and the corner of the building in the, uh, in the shadowy part there. So that's pretty much how I'm going to find that angle, which I would say nine minutes past the hour, nine minutes past the hour. But um, to help myself, I could find this line here, and that's what I'm going to do first. So it's a bit like a game of chess. That line is useful to find this line, so I'm going to put it in. So how do I put that in? I just take a, um, a line to here. There it is. So that line now is there. That's the width of the building on the right. And now I can take a knitting needle to that corner and from this here, and there we go. I find that line for the bank. So gradually I am whittling away at the key lines of structure within the composition. So there's my canal. Basically, that's where it'll be. Um, what's next? Well, there's a lot going on in the background, actually. Um, and if we look, um, there is the tree network behind. There's, um, there's this group of trees here, which sit above the, uh, the cottage. But it might be a better idea to do those once we've got our roof pick pitches in. So there we go. I'm going to put my roof pitches in. Um, now, those who were with me during the drawing class will know that I found the roof pitches by putting a line through the center here. This is the center of that white gable wall there. So how do I find that? Well, it's roughly halfway. You can gauge it, but if you feel up to it, just draw a line halfway. Once you've got the halfway point running through this box here, then I just take a tilt for the left-hand angle of the um, roof line. I would suggest that that's 11 minutes past the hour or maybe 12, something very close. And I just put that line in and I know it's going to point to this center line here. I don't draw that in very dark because it's a white wall. It will show up. So be careful there. And then we have another angle on the other side, which is asymmetrical, really. So you kind of has um, it is symmetrical. Rather. It's it's pretty much the opposite. So if that was 11 minutes past, this is about 11 minutes too. But there is something to bring your attention to. This corner here is lower on the picture plane, on the axis here, than that corner there, just ever so slightly. Just ever so slightly. So we can make that known in the drawing. Once you've got that, then it's a matter of finding the ridge line. Now, the ridge line we know goes off to the right downwards because it's above us. So at a moment on the clock, that would be about 16 minutes past. So I'm gonna put that on now. 16 minutes past. It's very close as well on the wall plate, this line here, that is very, very close to 16 minutes past. But actually, if that's quarter past, it's about half a minute to 45 seconds past quarter past. Not quite 16 minutes past. I'm being a little bit um, critical there because these two lines should converge ever so slightly as they go away to the right. So I'm making that allowance in my drawing already. And then finally, I just um, transfer that tilt. And that tilt is very close to that one. They're both very similar. And there you go. I've now got a building with a roof on it. 
I haven't got the chimney pots. I know they can go on later though. Although I do know that if you enjoy those sort of details, it is quite easy sometimes just to get a little bit of enjoyment at drawing the chimney pots before you move on. But I always recommend do the smaller details later when you've got the big shapes in. Otherwise, you might end up in a situation where you have to move your details. We don't want that. Right, so there's that uh, one building almost there. And then I use the same strategies for the bungalow. So the bungalow, we know, has a line through the centre here as well. We can imagine the line there. It's not quite halfway, um, but it would be if you were looking square onto the edge of the building. But uh, I've got to put this line in, haven't I? I need that line there, which is the line that supports this corner. So I gauge from the edge of my page to there. Let me just see I'm getting that correct. There it is. Right, now I've got that line, I'm going to attempt to find the line for the center. Now, if you've got a photocopy like I have, you could just draw on your photocopy a line down the center here. So if I use that fancy pencil thing that Zoom give us, that's where I mean, you're putting a line there. And to put that line there will help you because once you gauge where that is from the side, which is there, you now know where your angles for the side of the roof should sit. So I don't waste any time. I just get straight on with that. And they're about 11 minutes past the hour as well. They're not far off of this same um, angle here, very similar. So once you've got that one, of course, that there's no reason why you couldn't then take your knitting needle. And this time it's probably 11 minutes to the hour. I prefer to think of it that way, it gets easier than, that, than 19 minutes past the hour. So 11 minutes to the hour. And then I've got my second, line for the angle of the roof. So it's, it's all coming about quite quickly now. And so it should really, because if we were out in nature drawing these um, buildings in this atmosphere here, you'd probably find that it's, uh, you would draw it quite quickly. Um, but you can still use exactly the same methods that I'm showing you now when you're out and about painting and drawing. So, for example, I could take my knitting needle if I was sitting at the side of the bank of the canal and I could estimate that angle and I could transfer it to my pad. Admittedly, if it was on an easel, it would be a lot easier because I could raise the easel angle to the same as what I'm looking at, at least for the drawing stage. Obviously, I would relax it a little bit when I come put paint on else it would drip off the page. But you can see that you could use the same method of tilts, which are really handy. Now, because the bungalow is um, a lower building than the other one, you'll find that the wall plate here does something different. It, it tilts upwards to the right. Remember the ridge tilts down to the right? This tilts up. So that ex um, tells us that the eye level, our eye level, the horizon line, is slightly above that line. So that cottage is slightly lower than the position of the photographer and I did explain that my friend David took the photo and he is very tall gentleman 
and he's probably stood on a bank over there to get an even higher position looking down. So that's why that line goes upwards. Um, for the other angle of the, the, um, the roof angle there, it's very similar to this one. So you could take that one almost as a parallel. But I did want to point out that as this angle goes away from us on the edge of the right-hand side of the roof, um, because this is somehow closer to us, the wall plate, to the ridge, there is a divergence from here to here. Sorry, a convergence. And then from here to here, there is a slight divergence. So do not be surprised to find that that is slightly longer from there to there than from there to there. It could and should really happen if um, we are copying nature carefully. But most walk colorists I know, especially the ones who haven't done any classical training at all, they'll just make that the same. And it kind of makes everything feel a bit wooden when you do that and slightly twee. So if you want to get more depth out of your uh, your pictures, uh, especially with buildings, conventional buildings rather than modern buildings, then follow that idea because then you get them feeling a little bit more human and to scale. Which always reminds me to say that when you're doing a watercolour, even if, you know, you're just doing a sketch. It's a model. You're modeling what you're seeing in the real world. So try to remember that it's to do with scale and proportions. Right, so there's my two buildings. That's looking okay, I think it's gonna work. Um, and that can bring me quite quickly then to that background um, that we need to draw. So once I've got to this sort of stage, I can now start to throw in the background details because they will really help. So I'm gonna change the, the screen view a little bit. I'm gonna add another picture, the original. So there it is, um, because I wanted to illustrate. Now, if that's crowding your screen, you can apparently click on that and make it, um, oh, should be able to have both on at once. There we go. So you should be able to um, push one to the side and make it bigger or smaller. So please feel free to do that. Um, why I did that is because I wanted to show you on here where I'm gonna estimate the woodland behind shapes are basically like this. I just turn them into sort of cloud shapes. This one is a bit more tricky because it's the, the sort of skeleton of the tree without any leaves or such. Um, so what I tend to do with that is I, I would draw it like a leaf shape. It's like a big leaf shape like that. And then there we go. So. Let's start with the top of the tree, which I described like being a gigantic leaf. So I just put the top to it. That's what, as far as I can go into the sky. And then I'm gonna to start to draw like little cloud shapes because they're, they're like the perimeters for my trees. So, I tend to draw these quite light and loose because they are possibly gonna change. Not sure if I'll get them completely correct straight away. So because of that, I tend to be a little bit, um, I, I don't try to draw it too hard because if I do, 
I might want to re remove the guesstimation, but I think that's going to work. So having said that's okay, what I'll do now is I'll start to draw a little bit of detail where it needs to be on the, this tree, for example. I noticed that it has two main branches and they become like little Y shapes. One branch going this way, one branch coming off, forking to the left. And then the one that the, the main branch on the right seems to do the mirror image. So as long as you have a feeling of space within that um, tree shape, I believe you can probably get away with being quite minimal about that. So there we are, there's my tree shape. Um, again, you don't have to be too overpowering with the drawing of that, but I would suggest that you remember that in nature, branches tend to get thinner as they go away from us, i.e. skywards, the little twigs that we see on the end, we can just paint with a blur. So I just do the main branches like that and make sure they go a little bit thicker at the base and thinner towards the top. Once I've got that estimated tree shape in, I just erase the bubbly shape that I had around it, you know. Hope that makes sense because the key is we we actually want to get into um, painting. So whichever strategy gets you there quickest, I follow. So that's that's my advice there. The other shapes, which I could sort of describe as lassoes around the trees, they're vague. I won't do any more detail in those. You don't need to. Okay, hope that makes sense. So that's how I'm going to uh, deal with the trees. Of course, I will paint them. And when you're painting, you can also do a bit of drawing with the brush. So why do it in pencil now if you can do it later with your brush? And so the next big shape in the background is the bridge. So the canal ends up going under a road. It's not a major road, but it's, and it is a bit, a bit squashed in there, that bridge, you can't see much. You just see a little bit of the arch. So when you're faced with that, that's what you draw. You don't draw a lot, you just draw a little. So there's a little arch, stretches across the canal there. It's one of those, not that I've ever been on the canal boats, but I could imagine if you had to go under there, you have to mind your head not a lot of room. Those old uh, Victorians and Edwardians, I think they were pretty um, nimble people. <laughs> Luckily, it's not a long tunnel, but there it is. So there's the basic shape there. And then that brings my eye to the next detail. And that is the little bridge here. So there's like a little bridge, it's a, a rectangle that crosses over from one side of the canal to the other. And then above it, there is this great hewn squared piece of timber, piece of oak or chestnut or something. It's very heavy. It's really old. And it's just painted with bitumen and I don't know, I think it's kind of whitewashed on so that the cyclists don't get so the cyclists can see it maybe at night anyway they're the shapes so that's pretty much horizontal going across the water so keep that as a thin i would keep it as a thin rectangular shape make it easy on yourself and then the big piece of timber, which is the, it's what you shove when you want to open the gate, believe it or not, the, 
you could with one hand push that once the water is on the right side of <laughs> the lock probably push it with one finger but when the water is behind it nothing moves that <laughs> not even a cyclist So it's long and it sort of projects slightly at an angle, the push arm of the lock. And that, um, I would say, is 14 minutes past the hour. It sort of tilts upwards. It's, it's a huge lever. That's what it is. So there's the basic shape. And then we move on to the next big shape. Um, so you'll notice that just at the, um, the base of the bungalow, there is this pit and it is um, a parallelogram. It is the sort of width of two barges, you know, these long boats that they have on the canals, long and thin. You could get two in there. But I don't think that's their purpose. I think the purpose of this is a, it's like a big drain where when you want to empty the canal quickly, you can put the water into there. It's like a dry dock. Um, I, I never saw it used, to be honest. A lot of the old ways sadly have gone. So I'm just guessing that's what it's for. But I start off by taking the tilt, this tilt here, it's almost quarter past the hour, but not quite. So I take that tilt at the base of my bungalow there, and I'm going to put that tilt in. And then the next tilt that's quite important is from that corner to the corner of the White House there. You've got to give yourself a bit of width for the pathway there, where you could imagine countless people who have worked on these canals have walked back and forth along there as they attend to that lock. So there's that line. Just adjust it a little bit to make it just a bit more interesting. And then the final part is the line going back, which is not so difficult because you kind of find it at the base of the bungalow. It sort of follows long. Now, when you get to the, uh, the White House there, you'll see there's a strange wall. So I'll clear off the um, drawings. So I guess what that wall is, it's like, if imagine this is like a big basin, this wall, is almost, again, quarter past the hour, it just comes up slightly to protect that White House from all of the water that could potentially run into the wall. So it's like another wall. So I just put that in. And it's not so important that you get these things perfect, actually, because a lot of this painting will be won or lost, if we do it wrong, on our value map, because it is really an essay or an ex exercise in getting our values. 
It's quite a grey painting. There is some green, there is some blue, there is some yellow. Not very much red, admittedly, but there's some brown. So it's mostly quite tonal, you'll see. But if we get the big tones in, you'll, it'll, it'll really work. Um, or the range of tones. Okay, we are very quickly now moving towards detail. So what is detail? Well, it is things like the windows, the doors, the chimney pots, the fence. They're the last things, they're the small things. And when we've got those in, we can begin our painting. I'd like to start with um, an outline of the shadow on this gable end. See that, that's a, a very, very light shadow, which we can have fun with when we're painting. So when you've got what could appear to be, I'm not gonna say it is simple, but it could appear to be a simple watercolor. And they're usually the best, actually. They usually work the best, I think. Simple really does find success in watercolors. Um, bringing in details like a subtle tonal shift of tone, of shadow on it, can give you more depth plus interest. We can play around with that. We can change the temperature. We can use pinks, purples. Could look great. So always take the opportunity for that sort of investigation. There is another very subtle shadow as well, crossing the wall of the bridge there. It's like a little diagonal. Um, it's not so poetic, but it's there. So I may as well put it in. It could give us a bit more depth there. And then we really are going into small details. So be prepared now to start to draw chimney pots and windows, wherever you like, really, to begin. I may as well start with the chimney pots because this being Victorian, they are big chimneys. They, you know, they that was the central heating system. So they had to take a lot of uh, coal into these houses. So make them tall and make them a little bit bigger than you thought. You know, they're always a bit bigger, these chimney stacks. These days they have these steel flues, so you don't really need much brickwork because it takes all the heat. But in those days, you need a big chimney to keep warm. And this is quite a frosty little scene that we're painting, which will be fun. And you can, you'll be able to see when we come to paint that you can see the frost melting on the roof, which we can put in as a, as a nice little um, detail. So there's one chimney stack. I start with the one in the uh, the front purely because it, I can then gauge the other one. I know the other one is likely to be the same size, but of course it's slightly further back. So make it ever so slightly, if you can, ever so slightly narrower and not quite so tall because it's on a tilt going away from us to the right at the same pitch really as the roof. So I just use my knitting needle to guide those two chimney stacks so that I get them feeling as if they're in perspective. So there we go. Looks lovely already. And that's, that's the charm of working with simple um, buildings like this. They, uh, they do tend to sell as well locally if you find these sort of scenes that are not too challenging, but because you don't want it to be 
something that causes you a headache, but are charming in their own right. And you'd be surprised that if you have a local exhibition in your village or your main gallery or wherever, there will be somebody who attends who would probably walk their dog or go a cycle on Sunday to keep fit. There'll be someone who knows it or they're related to the lock keeper or something. And they go, oh, I want to buy that. So I always think um, never underestimate the ability of a simple scene to charm folk, especially if it's somewhere close by that everyone knows, you know, especially if it's kind of a little bit off the beaten track, you know, but still people go there. So I'm simplifying it a little bit. Please forgive me for that. I know there's a, a like a third door or something in the middle. I, I'm not really keen on it. It seems to me to be at a later edition and sometimes I prefer it how I think it should have been or was. Um, so I go with that. Now this uh, bungalow, are they, they're kind of 1970s design. Um, and it's not the sort of thing that you might think, oh, that will work as a painting. But in a watercolour, it takes on a different charm. And that's the thing about watercolour that um, is unlike any other um, media. It's very poetic. So it can lend charm even to a 1970s design, which are now starting to get their own place finally, you know, um, isn't that strange? Because in Britain, for at least in the 70s, many of the beautiful Edwardian, Victorian, you know, dare say even Georgian buildings, they ripped great, great swathes out of them and put 70s additions into them. And um, they never, ever seem to gel. They never seem to find a resting place within the architecture, but suddenly, somehow, I don't know what's occurred, but they seem to be working, um, perhaps. Anyway, they always work in watercolours because watercolour lends magic. So as long as you draw it in perspective, shouldn't be a problem. So I put those um, modern style windows, which are qu quite large, in comparison, they're always quite, um, you know, the uh, the Victorians, they had long, thin windows, you know, quite like the continental style. But in the 70s, everything went the other way. We got picture windows, which are more like landscape format, quite long. And with a kind of a Mondrian aspect where you have a rectangle within a rectangle within another little rectangle which is the opener i kind of like it works well um in the watercolor as i say so there's um another one of those little mondrians And the little bungalow looks a bit like a hut, but it's working. Doesn't seem to have a chimney, so I'll leave it at that. Hope that's helping you so far. We're almost ready to paint, as I say, but we will need to put the fence posts in, perhaps. Um, but before I do that, I would just like to make one amendment. Originally, I used my knitting needle to establish the perspective for the canal there. But as we can see clearly on the color version, at least, this line, it is straight to there-ish. But from here, it is on a different trajectory. So we have to find that tilt there. So what I do is I will follow this line across to here, and then I just start to, to tilt 
back a little bit here. I'm going to keep the original line at the base somewhat because that could um, help me with the shadow on the bank. I hope that makes sense because the bank itself has a certain amount of thickness um, because they're cut literally the nickname in England for these canals is the cut. Um, they're cut into the earth and you have a bank, which is almost like a, a vertical here. Now, of course, there is a wall there. It was built with bricks. So the canal bank itself is a wall, but it ro rolls a little bit there. So we have this sort of dark structure here and then it rolls up to the bank of grass which is again a bit frosty there's touches of frost on there right so that's um now starting to position itself to looking like it could be quite successful. So all we need to do now is get those other elements in. So I just quickly put that aspect there. There is, as I said, there's like a brick wall that's built down into the cut of the canal. And on the top of it, they put these coping stones just to protect it all from the rain and the elements, etc been there for a while and then there's a bank here that curves off to the right and then we can start to put the posts in now the posts themselves they can cause a bit of an issue if you're trying to draw them 100 percent accurately it would take perhaps more hours than minutes so let me relieve you of that duty, if I may, because I just do this. I look at the first one, it's there. Once I've got the first one in, I'll then go to the next corner. So that's the one I can see. So I've just drawn that one in. And then across here on the corner of that basin, there's another one standing there. And it's pretty much the same height, but perhaps a little bit taller. So I draw that in. Now, I know I've made a mistake because it's not lining up with that window as it should, but I carry on regardless because it doesn't really matter for the watercolour itself, you'll see. It's just a detail. The next one is in the middle, so it's it's almost halfway but it's a bit further to the left than to the right just fractionally so i sort of gauge between this post and that and i find the halfway and then go a little bit to the left just to keep it in perspective and i just keep them all sort of uh, level with my knitting needle hope that makes sense so there's three now there's probably a half a dozen other ones going off from there down to the, um, the main cottage there, which um, I'm gonna simplify now just by using a tilt to find their heights. And this is how you sort of, this is a, a, a sort of a, a trick really to keep these all in line. So the tops of these are quite critical. We know where the bottom is. The bottom line is there. We've already established that. But we now need to establish the top line. And that's going off and vanishing off ever so slightly downwards to the right, fractionally, almost level. So find the level from the top of that post. There's the level. And then just... Tilt it ever so slightly, not a lot at all. Hardly noticed that I've tilted it down slightly to the right. 
Now I've done a little line so that all of my posts can hit there. And then I'm just gonna have fun drawing one post after another, reaching up and give them a sort of an equal distance or similar. Maybe as they go off, it gets a little bit closer each one, just to give it a feeling of perspective. And then of course the posts themselves get ever so slightly thinner, but not so much that it's too obvious. And now I've got half a dozen other posts going off. Right, so hope that helps you because otherwise that is a thankless task, putting those posts in. Um, but that should, I have a feeling now, make it a bit easier for you. And I just adjusted the wall that I had here just so that my posts can peep up like little fingers above um, because they get darker against the white wall. And that's a nice poetic counter change because the posts can change value. They can go um, dark against the light and they can be slightly lighter against the dark. So. I like to have those opportunities to utilize what's known as the counter change. Um, if you're not quite sure what the counter change is, do not worry. It is something that we are going to cover um, during the course um, in more detail and with better examples. But just bear in mind that a post, even a black painted post, can appear light against the dark background and vice versa. I just put that little lean-to building in. I know it's not essential, but it's there. It's a little building like such. And we're very close now to painting. But there are a couple of other posts, so let's have a look. Now, the essential posts on the lock are this one on the right and this one on the left. These are like little um, cranks. So they have a little lever. It's a key that the boat, the boatsmen carry with them. Can't just let anyone play with those, or, or, otherwise it could be dangerous. So they have this special crank that they lock in, it's like a gear, and they turn it, and that raises the sluice gate to allow water in and out. So we have put those in. There's something that anyone who knows anything about canals will notice, and so essential details. More essential than the posts in the background, to be fair. So I put one on either side. There we go. And anything else? Well, not really. I mean, there are other things. There's like... Um, a handrail where you could step down into your boat. I, I'm not going to bother with that. You could too. It's very, it's a, it's a modern thing. Somebody's put that on in the seventies, but no doubt the original boats people that had to do it the hard way probably had their own ladder or something. Um, but there is another lock gate here. So I'm going to draw that in because otherwise it doesn't make, total sense we need that so there's a you can see there's a lever on the left and the right rectangles a bit like bicycle handlebars and then in the center there are the gates and this one's slightly open they're just opening it there so the water's run out so i just draw those as the basic shapes that i see rectangles 
bicycle handlebars, however you decide that you see them, it'll work. And that the sluice gate in between the two, it's just a, a rectangle with a line through the middle. So we always borrow from Paul Cezanne and we make it a simple geometric shape whenever we can, because that's what things are. Don't need to make it too complicated. There you are. We're ready to paint. Yippee. Yippee. <laughs> now, of course, this is the essential. When you're drawing, of course, you, you might draw more detail. Um, so what could be another aspect of detail if you want to go really detailed? The, the These bars running across from post to post, that would make sense. There's three of them. So I just... Start off with the top line, making the connections. Now these do go through the counter change as well. So they will go, at some stage, they will look light when they're against a dark background. And at some stage, they'll look dark when they're against a light background. So they're a challenge when we come to paint. But people like them. People like these sort of details. I see many um, accomplished uh, and well-known watercolorist types who will just paint dark lines for all of them. Uh, so that would mean that when you paint a dark line over a dark background, it disappears. And that occurs in nature too. That's how they can get away with it. That's called a lost edge. Um, but it is a nice challenge to try to get the counter change and people really um, appreciate that aspect, even if they don't understand what you've set up for them. So I'm going to try to steer you in that direction with this one. Um, so what you have to do when you're trying to establish the counter change on these sort of posts is you have to paint, sorry, you have to sketch both sides of each post. So I do the top and the bottom edge. That is the easiest way for you, for me to teach you that. Because when we come to paint, we can decide, is it going to be dark or am I, am I going to leave it light? And sometimes in between, because you do get middle values as well. Okay. Hope that makes sense. But we're nearly there. So just a few more lines and then I'm going to stop the share to see if everybody's comfortable before we go into paint. And it will be standard paints today. And what I mean by standard paints, whatever your set has in it, is a standard set is usually going to be a yellow or red, sometimes an orange, but not always. You'll have a green, you'll have a blue, a violet, sometimes, not always. And you'll likely have a black. The only deviation I take is I don't use black or well, seldom do I use black, I'll use neutral tint instead because it just has a better, it doesn't, it's a, it's a smoother ground paint and it doesn't um, granulate the colour I add it to. Sometimes blacks can make blues go slightly, sorry, sometimes blacks can make yellows go slightly green. Neutral tint shouldn't do that okay so we're literally ready 
to paint. So I'm going to pause at this point. Now this uh, method I'm going to show you to prime your paper for the painting uh, only works really if you're using uh, a high proportion of cotton pulp within the paper. This is 100% cotton uh, watercolor paper. Um, I've forgotten the manufacturer. I'll just quickly look. Oh, it's Canson, American company Canson's Moulin de Roy, which is a good paper. It's quite, um, but this is quite um, smooth. I hope I've drawn it on the right side. Um, and if you take your hake brush or another flat brush, doesn't matter, you know, a baker's brush like this would be fine. And you turn over your paper and you literally paint the water onto the back of your sheet. And what this will do is it will keep the window of opportunity for the lights open for longer. Now, I recommend this in the studio because in the studio or your, wherever you're using watercolors in the house, if you can um, rig yourself up a hairdryer, because as with it, with everything, it, this is better in, you know, this particular method is better in the indoors than it is outdoors. But you can use it outdoors as well, especially on a hot day. You can see how wet that is now. It's thoroughly wet. And now I can use that to stick it onto my table. I've got a little um, easel like so that I can um, tilt this up and down and go front and back, which is good. Now I've done that, what I would do is I will prep it the other way as well. So as I paint this down, you have to be careful if your table or surface you know, if it's a lovely oak table, don't do this. I, I'm using, this is, um, what do they call it? Some plywood that I've made this out of. It's like marine ply. So it, it's th thoroughly waterproof. And I'd recommend if you can get a ply, like a marine ply, that's the best board you could use to do this particular type of non-tape taping down. So I just flatten that down. And you can see it's quite wet now. And that's good because it, it will allow me to keep the window of uh, light painting open for longer, which is good. And you'll see what I mean if, if that seems a bit odd in a moment. Right, so You'll see that it just almost like it has a suction. It just sucks down. If you use a big sheet, which I recommend it for that too. I, you know, I think it's a great method. Uh, sometimes you get a little buckle. So if you do get a little buckle, just um, lift one corner nearest the buckle and push down flat with your brush, the clean, damp brush, and you'll iron out the buckle if you get a buckle. I'm not saying you will, but if you do, there you know how to do, get around that. And now we're going to look at the um, value map. So I know you're going to be frantically try, <laughs> trying to paint that flat. It's just a map. If you don't want to do it this way, you don't have to. You can tape it with your, your tape. It's fine. Um, until you get a board. Next week, I am going to exclusively paint using this method because I'm doing a scene from Scotland, which has an amazing atmosphere that needs this open window for the lights. It needs to be open for longer, and this is how you do it. So I'm going to, um, or one way of doing it, there are other ways actually. So now I'm gonna show you the value map. 
because we're going to put our lights in. So I'm giving you five values here, but you'll notice that the white gable end of the building and the chimney are actually still brighter than that sky. So really, I'm going to reserve the light on the wall. That's going to be white of the paper. And I'm going to put a very light tone on that sky. So I'll just move that out of the way a little bit. And I'm going to take some pink. So this is, it doesn't matter if you use a lizard and crimson, which I think most of you will have in standard colors. Or if you don't have a lizard, and any red will do. I'm going to use permanent rose. You see that? Tiny amount. And enough is mixed up now for my sky. So I'm making a pink sky. But before I paint that pink in, I'm adding a little bit of raw sienna. Tiny, tiny amount. So it's a peachy pink color now and a tiny amount of neutral tint. Now be very careful with the neutral tint. Look, I just put a tiny dot. That's all I'll need. Maybe just a touch more, but better to go cautiously with that. What I want to make is a very, very light gray, pink tone. There it is. I add a little bit more water to thin it down. It's a very weak, thin mixture, like weak tea thickness. And now I'm going to place that in, you'll see, all over that sky. So I'm going to use this hate brush again to apply it because the bigger the brush, the better the brush for the first washes. So you'll see I'm putting this tone all over the sky, but you see how light it is? It's really hardly any difference perhaps than the white the paper but it is just slightly different and then i use a bit of masking tape to tilt my board you see that i'm tilting it ever so slightly now underneath so the water flows that away There it is. I've got a very, very subtle, soft pink sky tone. Right. I'll leave it in that position for now while I mix up my next tone. So as I mentioned in the light value map there, that sky is slightly light. But I want to get to light middle values now. That's the next one. Here's my value map. Trying to find my downloads. Here it is. That should come up again. Right. So if I can move it, there we are. So the next value is everything in the background gets some tone. And everything on the pavement, the water gets some tone too, but it's a different temperature. You'll see the temperature in the water is cool, but everything else is warm. So Let's take some raw sienna. Raw sienna is this yellowy golden color. If you don't have it, use yellow ochre. And I'm gonna make a tea wash of this with a small amount of permanent rose. So it gets pink, peachy color, and a touch of raw umber. Now, if you don't have raw umber, you'll likely have burnt umber. Be careful, burnt umber will make this incredibly up so a very small amount so it's this orangey peachy color now it's a stronger tea thickness and a little bit of neutral tint so it's a similar color wash to what we used before and i just start to you'll see i'm, I'm starting to place it in to the edges of these trees around the cottage I'm being particularly careful, or trying to be, to not paint into the, um, the steel posts, those, the, um, the bars that go across the posts. 
I'll do the same here as well. Painting outwards to that shape that I created in the drawing. I can actually paint some of the roof of the uh, cottage, but I'll come back to it. I can paint some of the trees here in the background. So you just be careful that you're, you know, and you'll notice that as you're painting outwards, like I'm doing now with the brush, to the parameter of your tree lines, you might get a soft diffusion of the color, like little, they're not blooms, but they're kind of like very smooth and they open. If they open a lot, which they can do, because remember, we have wet the whole paper. Then you can get, get a piece of um, paper towel and just draw some of it back up if you need to. But on the whole, it should be OK, I would have thought. I'm also going to bring this colour now down to my bridge. See that? And I'm also going to bring some of it along the edge of my canal. Now the canal is going to get very dark, isn't it? So if I paint this very light middle value, it, it probably looks dark now because of the contrast of the white paper, but it is very light. You saw it was a very thin tea wash. So I can paint that into my canal. I can also paint it into all of these structures. You know, the, uh, the lock gate. They're wooden anyway. I could also paint it into the bank where you've got the brickwork. There is a bit of this color there, especially in the light areas. And I can paint it along the edge of this walkway here or the bank edge. A little bit along this line here. And if I want to be quite true to the picture, there is in the grass here a little bit of mud where countless cyclists and walkers have trampled the grass. It's under like so. Okay, that's good. Now I did mention that some of this roof has that color in it. So what I'm gonna do now is treat that as a special area. So I pick up some of that color and I'm gonna go into the roof, just ever so slightly, but leave that patch of frost. You know, on the roof, there's like a patch of firm frost. So there we go, a little bit of the roof, not a lot. Same with this roof. I can put it all over that roof. They've obviously got um, a, a warmer house there, there's no frost on that. There we go. And I'll even put a little bit into the chimney pots, but be careful. If, if yours is like bleeding, like blooms, don't do that. Just leave the chimney pots for now. Okay. I'm going to add a little bit of pink to my mixture. So now it gets a little bit warmer. And I'm going to add a little bit of pink here and there where I think just over here by that post, it's a bit warmer. In the... Uh, soil here there's a bit of pink from the sunlight somehow i also uh, perceive a little bit of pink in the bridge so i put a little bit of pink on the bridge not a lot but a little bit anywhere else not really that seems to be about the limits of the pink um now I'm going to go in with a little bit of green. So for this mix, I just add into there whatever green you've got. Now it could be that your green is viridian. Let me just show you what I mean by that, because viridian is an amazing color, no doubt about it. But it might just be the wrong color. If it looks like that, that's viridian. Don't use that. If that's your green, add to it yellow ochre or raw sienna, uh, raw sienna like I'm doing. You'll see now it becomes sap. That's more like what we want. 
So we just want a sort of a sap green or any green that's not viridian or phalo. And now I'm going to just start to dot some green. You see, it's still T thickness. These are still sort of light tones. And I'm putting some green into my background trees, you see. And I'm still trying to keep the feeling of tree type shapes. That's important. Over here on my uh, image, if I pull it, bring it over, there's quite a bit of that going on here as well. So into this area, quite a bit of that green. And I, I tend to use the brush in a sort of, to paint the branches, even though I know it won't look like a branch for a while because the paint is still very wet and open, deliberately so. Okay, that's good. Anywhere else with that green? Yes, we could take a little bit more of this green and we can start to create little lines here. Now, did you see what I'm doing? I'm sort of going back and forth, but I'm allowing some of the white of the paper to remain because there's a frost on the ground. And as I bring the green through to pathway here, I'm just brushing it in, in the direction of the pathway. So there's a bit of green there. Add a little bit of yellow to the green now to bring it to this bank. And for this bank, try to brush with the direction of the curve of the bank. Sometimes when you do that, especially if your paper is now starting to dry a little bit like mine, you'll end up with some little dry brush strokes going in that direction. And that's not a bad thing. That's pretty good actually. So, but if you're not getting any dry brush strokes, marks, don't worry about it. We can build it up later. So there's some green. Now I clean my brush because I want to change my color. So the color I'm going to go into next is the blue gray along the water reflection. So for that, you'll need to use blue. I have cerulean. If you don't have cerulean, don't worry. You can use another blue, it's fine. But make it very thin and keep this blue to a tea wash. Now, I am going to add a little bit of my permanent rose or a crimson to it to make that blue go towards lavendery type blue, purpley tone, just slightly. And when you're happy with that color, paint it in to the canal. Now start at the edge of the water near the bank, because then you'll get an idea as it sits in to the water, you'll get a feel for its relative contrast. But if it feels really dark, add some water to it before continuing. And that now starts to feel more like what I'm experiencing there. Um, and then as you get that sort of shadowy shape building there, building into that area of the water reflection, add yet more water to your mix and shuffle that outwards and increasingly move towards the other bank. Now, it might well be that you would like to leave a small amount of highlight, perhaps in one corner, there's some very light tone. But most of this here, I have to say, goes beyond the white of the paper. So a very light white, a very light blue tone like that, almost white, as I say, but it's, you see, it's slightly different. Yeah, slightly different to the white of the paper. Good, hope that's helping so far. Um, we're nearly there, this is the light stage. So we, we go through every shape, one by one, thinking about what are we actually seeing there? If it's not a white, it needs some color, and what are the colors? So the next big shape will be this shape here. Now that's a raw umber, but it has a yellow tone. So I'm gonna make a new 
well of raw sienna, which could be yellow ochre if you wish, a tea wash with, so it's tea thickness, it's not very strong, and I'm adding raw umber. Now, as I said, if you've got burnt umber, it's not quite the same. So probably better to use a small amount of neutral tint to make your yellow ochre or your uh, raw sienna slightly mustardy. So you'll get this kind of a tone here. And as I paint that into its shape, what I'd like to do is think about keeping the posts light. I know they're dark, some of them, but I prefer to paint around them to give myself time to think about that option later. So I paint around all the posts and I just lay that color in. And even if I know it's gonna be darker, it doesn't matter. I just paint it in anyway. Now, while that is still wet, we can add a little bit of the purpley tone into it. So that's going to be fun. Um, right, so we need to mix a purpley tone. Now that blue is not far off purple. I could add a little bit of violet, but if you don't have violet, you could just add some alizarin crimson or permanent rose, doesn't matter, both do the same job. If you add that to any blue, you're going to end up gradually going to a violety gray tone. Now that is perfect for going in to here. You'll see it will just add a little bit of a shadow onto that edge. And treat it similarly to how you did your tree shapes because the shadow is a shadow of trees. Well, I'm careful to paint around my posts. Having a bit of fun there, adding a little bit more pink. Just a splash of colour, why not? Even a wintry scene from Britain can have a little splash of Impressionism in there. There we go. So I've got a mottled effect going on. And here's another way to achieve more mottled effect. Squeeze that brush now and just lift out a few little episodes within it. Because what will happen is it's wet. So the window of opportunity for movement is still there. And it will, it'll change a little bit. I can see it's closing up those little apertures. Um, hope yours is too. Found a little hair from my brush has found its way into my scene. Don't like that, so I just remove it with a pin. And so we now move on to the next shape that hasn't got any color. And there's a couple of them. There's the side here of the bungalow, that little lean-to thing, and of course the shadowy side of the white building. Now what happens to the white building in the shadow is it has a lavender purple shadow. Now that colour we just used on the shadow of the gable there is perfect. So we just paint that straight in, a little bit of purple. There it is. It's a light little value. I'm also going to do that along the uh, bungalow. Being particularly careful around the posts. And I also paint around the windows. Now those windows might have some of that purple light within them, but I'm not sure yet and I'm Definitely not a multitasker type person. So I just take one task at a time, think about one shape at a time. And although I think, yeah, that's working well, I also notice there's a bit of a pinky orange tone in that corner there. So how can I put that in at this stage? 
Well, I can. All I need to do is to pinch my brush, pick up a little bit of orange. There it is. Maybe a bit of pink. And I can use that to put into that purple tone. So here's my trick. I clean my brush again, squeeze it, lift a little bit there to accommodate what I'm going to add now. And these are the same thickness, so those two colors will link. And that's a really nice way. I don't see any orange in this building at all, but I did in that one. So I let it, I let it happen. Um, maybe just a small amount on this little hut that's leaning next to the house. Not a lot, just a little color, maybe a bit of pink, a bit of orange. And there we go, just to tone it down. And that really is now taking care of the first stage. That's my lights. Um, anything else? Not really. I think now I've got my lights in, I can now start to think about my middle values. So where are they? Well, to get my... value map up again. Here it is. So you can see that the middle values are literally on the cusp at the edge of those light middle values in most of the areas, even in the water on that building. We've already put that in, to be fair. And we're starting to see some in the greens, definitely in the trees behind and on the roof there and on the edge of the roof and the pots on the chimney and a little bit in the tree up there. So let's see if we can go through these areas. Let's start perhaps with this tree that we haven't even touched yet. Now that is a different brush. So for this one, you'll want to bring out either if you have a rigger brush, which is the long thin brush there, or if you don't have a rigger brush, you could use the number one or two round. That'll do it, but it's not so good. So what do I do? Well, I just mix up a little bit of raw umber this time into that mix there. I want between a tea and a coffee thickness. I think I'll go for coffee. There it is. And I'm just going to paint that outwards into the shape of my trees. Now, hopefully the the um, the paint the paper is still slightly wet. Hopefully, if it's really, really still wet because you put a lot on in the first instant, then maybe just maybe get the you know just wait or get the hair dryer onto it. But you can see what I'm doing now. I'm just flicking that brush around, creating a feeling of intertwining branches, trying to keep them thinner rather than go too wild at the top there. And then forks coming out at the end. That's good. And that will probably be just enough. Now I do see a little bit more of that going off in the other areas as well. So I'll do a little bit more, sort of a repeat idea. Nothing wrong with that. So you might see some of that over here. And that's okay. Over in this area, I think it gets a little bit darker. So I'm gonna add a little bit of neutral tint to my color. And I just start to have fun trying to create feelings or shapes of branches, ideas of branches, perhaps, in the next layer in those trees. And then as a sort of a last idea to that, I'll add a small amount of violet into that mix. 
because it'll just give me another tone, which is slightly more subtle and darker. And I can let that do its business as it changes on that wet paper. I just put a little bit on there as well, just to give this a little bit more depth. Not quite sure what the bush is there, but it just has a bit more form to it now. And this tree over here, it seems to be slightly further forward than the others. So it needs to be slightly darker. But you can see now, as I just randomly bring those brush strokes in, it starts to feel and look like a tree, which is good. Hope yours is too. You can add a bit more green because you might see some green in the trees, a little bit more green, whatever you feel it needs. But it's really very much abstract shapes. Okay. Abstract shapes. And there it is. That's the trees in the background. So in essence, it was raw umber. I added some violet in places and I also added green. There was definitely some neutral tint in there just to make it more gray. And I'm just having a bit of fun tidying up in there. Although I'm going into the next tone. So I'll stop because I know you haven't all got your middle values in just yet on the trees. So there we are. There's my middle values on the trees. If we look at the uh, value map once more, which is always a good idea, just to keep the discipline of where we are and where we need to go, a map, which is what it is, I can now see that I can start to put some tones into that basin, although it's very dark. There's some middle values in there. There's some middle values on the grass, on that roof and on the grass here, a little bit in the water. So these all need to go in now. I'll start with the roof. I haven't put anything in there yet. So what tones are they? Well, they're kind of similar to these brown colors. Um, if you want to start that afresh, you could just take some neutral tint. Neutral tint. Start with coffee thick thickness. There it is. And we could just start by seeing how it sits on the roof shape. I think it's going to sit fine. I'm trying my best in this area to keep a little bit of that frost on the roof. If I mess it up, I will just carry on, but I still feel I've got a little bit of the frosty effect going on, so that's good. Anywhere else? Yeah, a little bit of that gray along the side of the chimney. Now, if your paper is still so wet, it's bleeding everywhere, get your hairdryer on it and allow it to dry. Mine's okay, but there is a little bit of uh, something there, which I don't mind at this stage, but if it grows too big into the sky, for example, I'd be a bit annoyed. So I can just lift that out with a flat brush. Like so, and that's that taken care of. I'm also going to take a little bit of that gray tone 
along the bank here. I'm also trying to capture some of that pink tone, that sort of salmon color, or whatever that biscuity color was that we had on the bank. I'm keeping it, keeping some of that within my range there because it looks interesting and it you can see it as it turns to the light, that sort of color. So this was the color, this is the tone I had on the roof. I'm bringing a little bit along the bank. It looks very dark, I have to say, but it's not really. I'm gonna put some of that into here. As I, as I mentioned before, I'm not sure what color the posts are until I come to paint them. So I just treat them as an area to reserve. That's my advice until maybe you paint it several times and you have a chance to think about it. Sometimes you can just paint all of it in this stage. But when I'm teaching, I, I try to keep it simple for myself. And I think it's better that way for you. So I just paint. I keep it simple by making harder work for us, really. Sometimes the easiest way is hard work. So there's my little light posts. And of course, if you mess one or two up, don't worry too much. You just kind of go, oh, well, and you move on because one post messed up does not ruin the painting. Um, likewise, one post painted perfectly doesn't make the painting either. So it takes more than that. Now, every now and then when you're doing this, you'll, you'll find that you're chasing your tail because you just put your lights in and you forgot to put in a light tone down here, for example. Like when I was putting the tree tones in there, I should have taken some of that brown and I should have put it here on the wall at the base of the building. I forgot. It doesn't mean I can't now make amends. And so I do. So these are all good uh, things to, to observe. When it goes wrong, you, you really need to know what to do. And it's really not usually a difficult decision. It's just, oh, I missed a stage on that area, just go back. You, you're likely to have the paint in your pot still because you just finished there or something. So I just put that in. And then what I can do is I can take this gray into it, into what I just painted. And that's even better because I get the wet into wet merging of the two colors and that just feels much more naturalistic okay where else am i going to take some of this middle value tone well there is actually some of that middle value tone i forgot to put it in again on these capping stones here so i can just sketch those in like so paper's starting to dry down there. So if I want to make that a soft render, I just clean my brush, as you saw, squeeze the paper towel onto my brush, and then just soft render those edges, just blur one into the other. And that, that really helps to give you textures, which are more interesting. I can also use this brown tone um, it's a middle value along the base of the canal lock here. So you, you know that there is a sort of a shadow side to that. And then there's the light side where you walk. So I reserve the light. I, I don't paint into it. There it is. And then I'm going to carry on down the canal system to the gates at the end. So I put a bit of that brown on those. That's worked. 
I'll use a little bit of this middle value brown as well over here and there. There's a few steps over here. Just put a few steps in. There's some textures here. Now, I like to use the side of the brush. Doesn't even matter if it's a small brush like this. You can create textures. But when you put these sort of textures in, I'm, I'm attempting to put textures of the uh, earth onto that ground there. What I do is I uh, follow the form of the earth. So if the, the earth is cambering slightly, I allow it to camber. That's good. Anywhere else with that color? I don't really think so, but there is a couple of posts at the end, which actually, when you look at them, they do have that brown tone in them. So I'll just put that on them. I've done the lock at the back there. I've done the lock at the front here. Um, now I'm ready to put my middle value colors on the water and my middle value colors on the grass. So that's coming next. Doesn't matter which one you do next, but because I was just doing the grass here, I think that's going to be my next area. So I take my green and that's my green. And look, I'm mixing it now to a middle value thickness, which is either um, milky or like strong coffee. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to put a, a little bit of that texture onto the grass. Now, if your grass is very, very dry now, which mine is, I can use my atomizer but I protect the rest of the painting. So this is my atomizer here. I always spray it first to make sure it's working. And then I just spray where I want it to go a little bit more wet. So a little bit wet there now. And now as I add the tones of the grass, so these are like the little um, knolls in the grass. You get these little bits that um slightly higher. And again, I'm following the form of the grass. So this grass is, an, is a bank. So it curves upwards slightly. There's a curvature to it. There it is. And that I've created all those textures now just by dropping little bits into that, like so. It just so happens that the similar thing is happening on the other side of the bank. So over there, what I think I'm going to do, I'll, I'll do it a bit more controlled with a different technique. I'll just do some little random dots and mounds, little knolls of grass, little bumps. You can see that. And then allow a little bit of dry brush. So with the dry brush, I take the brush into Maestro Grip, which is between the thumb and the index middle finger. And then I just stroke that brush in the direction of the grass. And you get these little textures, which is very nice. Once you have done that, then just use your Maestro Grip here and there in the other area. And look, now I've got these sort of textures that look and feel like grass and I've captured within it the atmosphere of ice and frost so that was good that, and that wasn't difficult at all it's just a strategy anywhere else where there is grass well there is this little bank here so I just add a little bit of water and paint this area is not so big a deal but it needs a bit of green there it is so we're gradually getting there. It's really moving along, hopefully now at a better speed. Um, if I just move that across there, I might be able to move that screen a bit better for you. So I'll just do that. Try to move that over there. That's better. Now you can see all of that one. Good. I'll zoom in just ever so slightly here. Okay, and now this is starting to dry a bit better. I can move this across. 
Right, so I have got my lights in and my middle values is, is starting to take on um, some shape and form now. I need some middle values in the water. So there's my purpley gray water. Let's mix that up again in case you don't have it anymore. So cerulean blue or each blue that any blue you've got, a little bit of pink. There's a lavender color and a tiny touch of neutral tint. And you'll have, have a lavender gray color. Now mix that to a coffee. I would suggest coffee thickness. And then for water, when you're doing ripples in water, um, you, you've got to think of the how the water is sitting and it's flat there. So that's the plane that I am trying to make these brush strokes follow. So there we go, some little ripples like this. And just check to see how that sits. If it's too dark, try again. Just add a bit of water to your mix. And then once I've got that going, I will now start to put more little ripples. You can use Maestro Grip, but when it's very wet, just dab it on your brush like so, so you get that dry brush effect going in that direction, do you see? That's dry brush, and you can increase that. You can build in a dry brush onto dry brush. looks like water now and that's that's good now there is a reflection of this post here you have to nominate a post which is reflecting the wall in the water is that one there and your reflection will be directly below so with that in mind i work the magic with maestro grip <laughs> back and forth there it is sometimes these little reflections go further down because of the ebb and the flow of the water um, but bear in mind, it should be directly below, vertically, whatever object it is that's casting that reflection. See that? So that's starting to work. And that's the middle values in the water taken care of. Okay, anywhere else where we need that middle value? Well, yes, of course, there's the windows. So I just use some of that gray because it's the tone that's important. Those window frames there, they need a little bit of tone. There it is. So it's just a progression. Now, the thing is about following the discipline of a value map. You, you, you see that sometimes you can forget, like I did, there was an area, but I quickly realized, oh, I haven't done the water or I haven't done this. Um, so there's always a bit of playfulness with this sort of structure of working or methodology. However, what the discipline gives you is a very strong backbone for success. You can see now I've started to put in these middle values into the window reflections. That was a good strategy. I can also start to even put it in to the lean to here, where it's darkest. And now I am going to start to put that in on the posts as well, because I'm starting to see that the posts are very dark, but there's always a bit of light, side lighting on posts. So I know I have been very, very um, committed to keeping these posts light until the end, but now I don't mind because I know that they are middle values after all going into darks but some of these posts these bars they're still light so I just work out which ones they are and I reserve them and the rest of them can have a tiny amount of tone so I just use my brush you, you can either just 
go back and forth till a little bit of tone arrives in those bars. That's a good strategy. Or you can mix up a very thin wash and you can paint that in locally. Doesn't really matter which way you wanna go. I'll also use a bit of this gray tone to paint over the wooden post here that goes outwards. And I leave a little bit of a uh, reserved light at the top of it for the contrast, keep that light there. Anywhere else? Well, yes. The last place is those locks at the back there. I just put a bit of the darking to those. And I am very close now to going into my dark middle values. But before that, I've got to put a bit of this um, gray along the canal here. It does get darker in there, but there's also these sort of middle value grays as well. I'll put that in now. Any more? Yes, I think the last thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a little bit more middle value along the edge of the water where it meets those wooden structures and a little bit more along the edge of the water here where it meets the um, bank. That's helped. And now we're really ready to go to the next value. Okay. So what is the next value? Well, the next value is the dark middle value. And if I summons up the middle value, uh, the value map, there we go. We can see where the dark middle values are. They are on the roof in areas underneath the roof, the uh, wall plate. On that roof there, there is some dark middle value. There is some dark middle value obviously in that pit and on the posts, all of the posts pretty much. There's some dark middle value along the canal and into the shadow over the bridge, mostly. And then last but not least, dark middle value along the water line where the bank meets the water. It gets very dark along those lines. So they're the areas, a small amount on, the on this edge of the wall of the canal. Just a small amount. So nearly there. And I probably didn't say the windows on the uh, building as well. On the... So for that, we need now creamy thickness, neutral tint. So I go a bit stronger. And what you tend to find when we go towards the darks, the shadowy tones, which is where we are now, there's less color. You don't see the color, but you might see temperature. So start with neutral tint, make a sort of creamy thickness like this. You could start at the bank where you've got the split between the water, like so. See how that sits. It might be too dark or might not be dark enough. You, you will make that judgment as the contrast touches in. And then you'll find as you put the darks on the structures of wood as well, like so, how that sits. You'll know it's right because you tend to find um, it focuses, it'll focus. That's really nice. So there's some good starting points. As you put them in, you might wish to just here and there soften some of the upside edges. The light facing edges can sometimes be softened. How do you do that? You clean your brush and you just touch an edge with a damp brush that you want to soften, say on the bank there. And then it gives it more form. 
Okay, so you carry on. I'm going to uh, paint over the posts. Now, which way is the light coming? Well, the light is coming from above left. So when you're painting the posts, anything above and left, give it a little bit of a wide berth and then just paint to the right. So the posts get a little bit more extra dimension just by leaving a bit of rim lighting on the left. It's not a lot, but just a little bit. So you can see now, as I do that, my posts all start to resound with depth for some reason. It's just putting that tone on. Now, as we go down the posts, be careful, they're not quite so strong. You might have to put less dark on the edge because the light is changing direction. It's coming through a little bit and giving a bit more illumination. So bear that in mind. So slightly less dark on the edges of the post as they get towards the building. I'm gonna put some of that dark depth, uh, tone, whatever, middle value, dark middle value along the wall plate straight away. That'll make a big difference to your contrasts. See what a big difference that makes. And then what I like to do is I just bring a clean brush, slightly squeeze, but not fully. And then just put a touch of moisture, like um, siphoning the, the color down on those edges. This is the fall of light or the fall of shadow. You can see as I did that tone, it kind of runs, well, not runs a bad description, flows slightly down. That's good. That's coming to life a little bit. I'll also need to put a bit of this tone along the canal this away as well. So underneath the, the post here, gets a bit darker, and then around the post, going down the canal. I like to leave a little bit of that previous gray, so I'm a bit sort of, you see what I did? I, I don't know if that's visible, but I don't paint all of it with that. I just sort of drop a little bit of that tone in here and there, allowing a little bit of light in the canal. There. And then when I finally get to the end there, a little bit more tone on some of the architectural st structures of the canal there, like the posts, just to make it feel a little bit of noise. I don't want to overly sort of ruin it by making it too prescriptive. I like people to work it out themselves a little bit that people enjoy that in a watercolor. They don't want to be told what it is. They want to work it out. And now the windows. So I put the dark middle value into the windows. Be very careful that my uh, advice is, even with a brush like mine, which has lost its tip many a year ago, you can squeeze into the corner gradually, so make a little point in the corner and then stroke back to the other and keep it square. You drew it square and now you paint it square. So that's, that's working now. I get much more depth there. I'm also seeing some of that shadow around on the bridge, do you see, behind. And this is where I start with the dark middle value and I paint around the architecture of my posts and things. I'll paint along the floor of the foundation of my cottage a little bit, you see. But then I'll do something which is very important now, which is to add a little bit of water So I take some water on my brush and I stroke it into the neutral tint. And look, I just allow it to push outwards. 
add a little bit more water. And then this time I'm going to the line of my shadow. Remember I drew that line of the shadow at the beginning. It's come full circle now. And I create what I would call a rendered shadow, which goes from a range of depth, dark to a lighter tone. That's always nice to achieve. See if you can manage that. And then more of the creamy thickness on the edge of that roof there. And see if you can do that again, what we just did. So what did we just do? We just did a soft, um, transition that was the word i was after before so i just add a bit of water to my brush then touch it with the towel and then transition across so i get this kind of slight flow of value that really is good to do we're going to do that as well um several times so don't worry you're going to get good at that if you've uh, struggled with it we're going to put a little bit of that now into the pit. So this is the dark tone into the pit between the posts again. So that's good. It's giving us a bit more depth. And as I said, when we get to this layer of tone where, where we're into darks, there's not so much color anymore. As we turn, take the light away, it, it becomes less perceptible. Color starts to retreat into darks. And at that stage, we can either go warm or cool in the temperature of the shadow. Um, Many watercolour artists will just use neutral tint. I can think of several who don't even worry about it. And they're, they're dominant in the world scene of watercolours. They just paint literally greys. So you can. That's fine. Everybody to their own. But to get this shift, transition is something they all do all of them so when i put this tone in now which is my dark middle value behind my posts i now want to clean my brush and transition that outwards so i put a little bit of that tone and then i add water to it because there is like, just like I did on the bridge there, there is a sort of shadow going across that there as well. So I can emulate this idea several times and it, it will make my painting have more atmosphere. See, now I have sort of depth into that pit, which, which I didn't have before. And I've also got depth over here and just soften this edge there while I'm thinking about it that's better everything that's further back should be softer really okay and now I'm going to go on to the roofs so this is where I'm going to take a slight temperature change because when I look at the greys on the roofs they're up in, in the sky and if you recall my sky at the start it doesn't look it but it was a sort of pinky tone in my studio it looks pink so if i add a little bit of blue to that gray now i can make a cooler roof color ever so slightly as it launches itself up against those light contrasts so i'm adding a little bit of blue i'm doing it just to highlight the fact that you can change the temperature of your shadow tones or your darks. And in nature, what tends to happen, there is a logic, of course, in nature's rules and principles. What tends to happen is if you have um, 
warm lights, you'll have cool shadow tones. Okay. Now, with this building, we have a warm edge to the gable. It's a yellow golden color. So I can use that cool again here. But I've got that frosty tone and I think there's a bit of a brown tone there. So I'm adding a bit of raw umber into my mix because yeah, nature does say that there is a warm next to a cool, but when the guys who put the roof on, they used a brown tile. So there is some brown in there as well, but it's a cool brown. It's raw umber, not burnt umber. So, so even warm colors can be cooler and vice versa. Cool colors can be made warmer. So there is this kind of interesting play between the, the, uh, the, the temperatures. So bear that in mind. And that's what makes watercolors such a fun occupation because we have all these wonderful things to think about. Notice I've left this sort of little window here for the frost. Now, of course, the frost in there is in the shadow. So it is likely that it's a purple because white, which is what snow is, goes bluish purple in the shadows. And I'm gonna explain more about that next week, but I've just made a slightly purpley gray there, which I'm gonna play with by adding some pink because <laughs> purple is a red and a blue. So it can go two ends of the spectrum. You can add into it little bits of purple and then you'll get a feeling of the prismatic qualities of light, even in the shadows. We saw that last week, how important that was in the shadows around the temple. Hopefully this week you've found this one slightly in... Um, I was going to say easier, but actually that's the wrong. I'm going to say straightforward, more straightforward than last week, because that was unusual. I dare say if I was an Indian watercolorist or if we were Indians, that would be our usual thing. We'd be used to seeing prismatic light. But for us in the Northern Hemispheres, <laughs> we only see that sort of playfulness of light at sunset maybe and sunrise and, th and then only little um, glim glimpses of that perhaps although I know in America I was quite amazed because on the east coast and perhaps in the late Great Lakes there's a lot of reflection from water so you get a lot of prismatic qualities there too so you'll have beautiful purple shadows and very like something out of an impressionist's um, dream, really. But for most of us, it's kind of grey at winter time, and we're used to only seeing perhaps temperatures in those shadows. So hopefully, it's starting to come together now. You're getting a feeling of those tones. I'm actually tempted to put a bit of this purple in the tree up there, so I will, because I just see a little bit more. I added a bit of water to that, to be fair, to make it a little bit lighter, but I just see in those final, final phase of the painting, I could add a little bit more there. And what I'd also like to do before I go is the chimneys. Um, of course, they need to be done. And anything else? Yeah, those posts, we need to get the darks on those posts. But first of all, the chimneys. So we haven't really used terracotta, but we can. So an orange. So if you don't have a clean space on your palette, I would recommend cleaning one up because we're going to make terracotta colours. 
for the chimney pots, they'll be nice. So use an orange, there's an orange. Add cadmium red, there's a terracotta. Now it might be a little bit too much, that bright tone. So add a bit of neutral tint just to gray it. The neutral tint will neutralize the color a little bit. And then let's see how that looks as a coffee thickness wash, first of all. So not too strong. These are details. So in the details, what I tend to do is you can do maybe three values, a light, a mid and a dark. And sometimes you get away with just two, a light and a dark. So I'm just going to put a light, which is really a middle value. Add more red to it to make it sort of more syrupy, like um, creamy thickness. A tiny touch of neutral tint. Maybe a bit more than that. There we go. And while it's wet, just touch a tiny amount of shadow on the right. Keep all your shadows on the right and you'll be fine. There we go. So there's my chimneys. Now, of course, the chimney pots lead your eye to the purpley gray shadow, which I still have some of along the edge of the chimney stack. So I paint that in now. So that's working nicely. And it's at this point, you can start to think about getting towards the end. You're thinking, is there something else that I need to adjust perhaps? Because it always can happen that, you know, maybe for example, I want a bit more depth in the background there. So I'll add a bit of tone, dab some color in. But I could also put a glaze. Now a glaze is where you add water to a color, say the purpley blue gray tone which was very nice. Remember that was just pinks and blues. Add some water to it. And if you want to, you just add a very small glaze, maybe on the edge of this building, just to make it stand out a little bit more. And as I bring that tone across, I think, yeah, that really helps. And then I'll just add a little bit more water and fade out the tone as I get to the back of the building. So it's slightly stronger here, if that makes sense. And if that works there and you like it, you can try that again over here. Now, of course, when you're painting around the windows, don't paint into them. You've already established the reflections, but look, it looks, looks like now there's someone who live in there, you've got a little bit of life coming into the scene. That's good. So that's just final adjustments of your values. Anything in the water? Yep, yeah, I think the water needs a little bit more strength. So neutral tint again, maybe not as strong as um, the reflections we did on the edge of the water there, like dark middle values, but Maybe just here, Maestro Grip again, if you can get that going, it's gonna really help. And just put in some, see that little dry brush marks, this way and that. That really brings that part of the paint to a finish. Anything else? Yes, we need to finish off the posts on the the lock. Now the lock itself uh, has these dark posts. We saw those. So this is quite creamy thickness. As I paint these in, they're going to come forward. But they cast little shadows. Even in this sort of light, they're casting a shadow. So I just take a little bit of that lavender purple and I put the shadow on the building, same color. And I'm just going to stretch a little shadow along the ground underneath that post. 
<clears throat> and then for the last time I paint that post, I want to make the beam that you push nice and dark as well. And you'll probably find lost edges in there because it's a dark post, but with a dark background, you can't help it. It will disappear a little bit, but you've still got to try to capture it. And then it'll come out the other side. And then you're faced with the old flaking paint, the, uh, what do you call it, lime wash paint, whatever they used. So leave that mostly as you painted it, but put a few little distressed tones around it here and there. And there you go. We've got, uh, I think we've got our scene. We'll just double check. Oh yeah. Just to finish off a few little things. So we've painted our posts with these little beams. I can now put a line underneath some of the beams, like these ones here, to make them stand out a little bit more. So there's a shadow under the light side with my rigger brush or a fine brush. That makes those stand out. These are the dark posts against the background. The little beams go dark against the white background. So that's that finished. That looks good. And notice that the tree here on the corner of the building wraps one branch in front of the building, which is interesting. That gives you more depth. So I will add a very last bit of green with my rigger brush and make this because it, it's going to be strong, sort of creamy thickness. And I just put a few little, maybe with a little bit of neutral tint into it, just to make it a darker green. I just put a few little branches in front of my um, bungalow. just to make it feel like there's a bit more depth, that's all. And there's the tree it came from. And just for good measure, a little bit more shadow tone. And then I think we got what we came for. So let's just double check, everything's good. Maybe just a few little bit more divots in the grass here coming forward. But there we are, a seemingly straightforward scene. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to stop the share there and let's see how you did. Don't take your picture down yet. I want to get a picture. Okay. What I'll do, Meredith, is I'll zoom into it. Yeah. Okay, great.